the second meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Um, can I remind uh, members of the audience and, uh, to switch off any electronic devices, uh, as these may affect the sound system? Um, can I begin by welcoming Alec uh, Rowey to his first Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee meeting and invite him to declare any interests he might have that are relevant to the work of the committee? Mr Rowley. Thank you, Chair. I have no relevant interest to declare. OK, thank you very much. Um, can I also take this opportunity to thank David Stewart um, for his very considerable contribution to the committee over the last 18 months? I'm sure I speak for all of the committee on, in that regard. Um, he now leaves us to join the Health and Sport Committee, and I wish him well. We all wish him well in that role. Uh, the second item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items four and five in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We now move to agenda item three, which is to hear evidence on the Scottish Government's Wildlife Crime in Scotland Annual Report 2016. Can I welcome Laura Buchan, Head of the Health and Safety Division, and Sarah Shaw, Head of Wildlife and Environmental Crime at the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Good morning. And also Sean Scott, Detective Chief Superintendent, and Sergeant Andrew Marvin, the Scottish Wildlife Crime Coordinator of Police Scotland. Uh, members, as you can imagine, have a series of questions. Uh, and I think we'll kick off by addressing perhaps what has been the biggest wildlife crime related issue in the period uh, since you were last before the committee, and that is the admissibility of video evidence in relation to um, alleged uh, incidents. Um, Sarah Shaw, can I ask you, I know we've, we've had correspondence between the committee and yourself on this issue. Could I ask you to kind of lay out the Crown Office's position on this issue? And this is obviously covertly obtained video evidence. So I think your mic's not on. Oh. Don't touch oh, them. Sorry. sorry. No. Okay, uh, so I should have said it works automatically. That's fine. Thanks, sorry. Uh, the Crown Office position is very much as set out in the letter I sent at the end of May in 2017. Uh, I think that is a, a good summary of, of the Crown Office position. I, I don't know if there's specific questions you have um, over and above what's in that letter. Yeah, that, we, we do indeed. I, I mean, to kick this off, and I know colleagues will want to come in, have there been any cases, to your knowledge, where covertly obtained video evidence of the kind that was, that was noted at the time has been used in prosecutions of wildlife crime? Because I understand there's a degree of flexibility here for the Crown Office in this regard. There can be exceptional circumstances. There have been cases where evidence, video evidence which has been obtained covertly has been used in evidence and there have been convictions. It's important to highlight obviously that each case must be considered on its own facts and circumstances mm -hmm. and the, the law on admissibility of evidence must be applied to the facts and circumstances of each case. Um, and its individual uh, <coughs> considerations. Um, so, yes, there have been examples of uh, covertly obtained video evidence being used successfully in a prosecution. Uh, however, uh, that is not to say that it would be possible for that type of evidence to be used in every in every case. So, is is the to, to develop my understanding of this? It, it, is a determining or the determining factor? the purpose for what, or the intent for the covert surveillance having been deployed. Is that fundamentally at, at the heart of this? I don't know that it's possible to say that that's the, the fundamental issue. I think there are a number of different considerations in each instance uh, and the facts and circumstances of each case are entirely relevant, as are the facts and circumstances surrounding the obtaining of the, the video evidence. Uh, the circumstances in which video evidence is obtained in any case, will, the, the circumstances will vary in every, in every uh, case. Those are the 
some of the facts and circumstances that must be taken into account, as well as the, the wider facts and circumstances of any case in determining whether evidence is, or, or considering whether evidence um, is likely to be admissible or not. So, so perhaps it would be useful to get this on the record. What are the broad brush rules that are at play here about video evidence and its admissibility, in, in layman's terms, as, insofar as you can provide that? Perhaps if I could come in at this stage, um, I think as Sarah has set out uh, in our letter where she set out the laws on omission of evidence, I don't know whether it would help for me to read out part of that for the committee. Um, because as with many areas of law, whilst the covert video evidence um, is applicable in wildlife crime, and we've seen a number of cases where that has been used. It does, of course, come into play in all different spheres of law. Um, and when we are looking to consider that type of evidence, we need to think about how that then is properly applied and how that implications of how that law is applied could ha then affect other types of crime and the way in case cases um, could progress. And very much the, the way that we apply is still in line with the case law of Laurie v Muir. And in that case, um, the full bench um, concluded that an irregularity in the obtaining of evidence does not necessarily mean that, that the evidence is inadmissible. However, the, the prosecutor acting in the public interest does have to look at that and perform a balancing act when considering that and whether that irreg sorry, the irregularity can be excused. And that speaks about the nature of the irregularity and the circumstances as which it is committed. So I know um, earlier you spoke about the Crown having some flexibility. I'm not sure flexibility is the, the, the correct term. What we do is look at the circumstances of each case in, along with the law um, that we are following and apply that and determine whether we think in those circumstances if there was an irregularity and whether that irregularity is such that it means that everything that flows from that is therefore inadmissible. So these are the various tests that we apply when we're considering the cases. And I know that we often and regularly say that fat cases turn on their own facts and circumstances, but that is very much the case. And we do take the prosecution of wildlife crime, and in particular, raptor persecution, is a priority. And if we have a case that we think there's sufficient evidence and that we can take to court, then we will do. But we do have a duty as public prosecutors to make quite difficult decisions and unpopular decisions. Mm -hmm. um, but what we would like to reassure the committee and the public is that there is a high degree of scrutiny and consideration that we go into when we look at these cases. Um, that the specialist prosecutors in the team um, know the case law, they know the framework in which they're working in, um, and they have the expertise to consider that. Um, there, there will often be disagreements within the team, speaking amongst lawyers about how best to apply it. Um, and we then don't stop there. Often when we have cases of this magnitude and decisions of this magnitude, they are um, reports prepared to our senior advocate deputy within Crown Office to make a final decision as to whether cases should proceed or whether in some instances um, we should no longer proceed um, when we are giving evidence. Um, I don't know whether that's helpful or if there's anything I can expand on I there. Think it is, it's it's quite difficult. I colleagues to come in, but I think this is an opportunity to, to um, perhaps address some of the wider public's concerns about this issue and to explain to that audience out there what sort of things you, you have to take into account. And hopefully, as each question has come along, we can tease that out. Stuart Stevenson, to be followed by John Scott. Uh, thank you. And this may end up being one that the police wish to uh, answer. That, that video evidence will of the type we're talking about start as being information and not necessarily evidence, would be the question. In other words, although it might be apparent right at the outset that what has come been presented to the police or to the COPFS is not going to be suitable as evidence in a criminal prosecution, it nonetheless can direct the police into an area of investigation. 
And I just want to test whether that is a fair observation on my part. And perhaps that's a police question in the first instance rather than a fiscal one. Okay, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I suppose the point at which it gets to the Crown Office uh, will be the point where we've already investigated and yep, we have that exactly. video evidence. Uh, and uh, the, the admissibility of that is then something, obviously, that the, the Crown Office will <coughs> decide upon. So, and, and obviously, we explore every single opportunity we can to get evidence in wildlife crime because, as I've made mention at previous committees, it's very difficult sometimes mm -hmm. to evidence it because of the nature of where it occurs and, and, and the, the crime itself. So, so any video evidence we will present and clearly discuss with the Crown Office about how that uh, comes about. I suppose the other part um, that's worth pointing out is that... Uh, our operational activity in terms of deployment of cameras and uh, you know directed surveillance is, is clearly bound by strict legislation. Um, so any any activity that we might want to do in relation to any type of crime, not just wildlife crime, is bound by that legislation. And uh, in terms of you know serious crime test, what have you? three-year sentence has had to be applicable. So there's a, a number of factors before we can even consider deploying uh, cameras in, a, in, a, in an investigation, if you like. So, um, But when it comes to the point, I think uh, we're looking at here in terms of evidence that maybe comes from a third party, from an NGO or a charity that's engaged in work, then uh, we will take it, everything that we have, and discuss that with the Crown about its invisibility. But, but, but just to close it off briefly, something that it's apparent doesn't have the evidential chain mm -hmm. from source through all the way that would enable you to take it through as prosecution evidence ultimately, nonetheless could trigger, if presented to you, an investigation, even though the video evidence itself would not form part of any subsequent prosecution, and you know that at the outset. So in other words, there is a value in the, the video or other similar information, it might be still photographs or whatever, um, that, that nonetheless they, they are of value to the police in alerting the police to potential uh, criminality in relation to wildlife. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, that, that evidence uh, or, or that material itself, whether it becomes evidence or not, is clearly intelligence as well. Yes. Uh, so it gives us an indication that whilst it might not fit the test and therefore yep. uh, be able to be prosecuted, we have some intelligence that there may be suspicious activity in a certain area by certain people. And then obviously we can keep that in mind and potentially use that in the future to, okay. uh, to further further investigation if, if that's you. applicable. But, uh, can, I, can I ask before John comes in? Are there any circumstances in which you're aware that Police Scotland have uh, worked with a third party to obtain footage of that nature, knowing we worked with them? In, in terms of the deployment of cameras yes, to gain, yes. we, we couldn't do that. You can't do that? No, no we, we, are not, we were uh, unable by law to do that. So, as I say, if we... If we uh, because of um, the level of intelligence or sufficient intelligence have suspicion uh, that we could uh, apply to deploy a camera, it has to fit a test. Uh, and, uh, and it's yourselves that would arrange the deployment, yeah. not through a third For one of our investigations. Right. For other third parties, what they do with cameras and their raison d'etre, and, and you know, that's mm -hmm. obviously for them. But. Okay, thank you. John Scott. Well, my question, thank you. Good morning, gentlemen, ladies, was essentially around that as well. And the importance, which hasn't really much been discussed about the importance of authorisation and, and permissions, uh, the proper authorisations and permissions being put in place as for any covert operation. Uh, and indeed, if you would like to expand into the area of ECHR compliance in that regard, for any of you to pick up on, please. So, sorry, the, so the question is... The importance uh, of authorisations oh, being in place. Absolutely critical, and, and without the appropriate level of authorisation, uh, that we, we can't proceed. Uh, so even, even as an investigator, I wanted to do it, unless it's authorised from the appropriate level rank within our service, detective superintendent, uh, then, you know, we can't, we can't progress. So. taking an admissibility so whilst we might not even be thinking about RIPSA when we're looking at all ways in which evidence is obtained so if a search warrant isn't properly granted or the police obtain evidence without a search warrant then then that evidence falls because of that irregularity and um, going back to um, Stuart Stevenson's point what I would say in relation to the video evidence it is the 
the intelligence that can be used and the, the successes we've seen in terms of the close working partnerships in relation to which the police have with um, NGOs and working together to identify where there is crime um, and how then that crime can be targeted in the most appropriate way to ensure a successful conviction. Um, so just just to reassure the committee, we, we, we have tried, we've tried to look at the uh, uh, the creative use of existing legislation to see if there's something that we could do um, within the current statutory framework to allow the deployment of cameras. So, for example, last year I commissioned a bit of work uh, in conjunction with uh, the Office of the Surveillance Commissioner to look at the legislation, see where is there anything we can do with it just now. And unfortunately, we're bound by the fact that there is a, a serious crime test in terms of the deployment of cameras uh, uh, for, for any crime, effectively. Uh, and uh, so at the moment, you know, clearly if there was to be uh, a wider scope for the deployment of cameras by, for example, the police and other organisations, legislation would need to change. There's no question about that. Indeed, and this has been well understood for a number of years, um, this need for authorisation and permissions, and it's yeah. not a revelation to anyone no. particularly. It's inflexible, I <laughs> think. So. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you. That was the point. OK. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Thank you. Can I ask about the wider use of the photographic and video evidence in order to alert the public to uh, potential cases of wildlife crime and, and indeed to then gather more evidence on the back of that? Um, we've seen, for example, in the last year a number of incidents where photographic evidence has been brought forward. Um, I think it was an example of a case in, uh, in Moy where two masked gunmen were seen um, with, a, with a weapon um, at the foot of a, of a tree of a nesting site, and yet that, that photographic evidence was not released to the public for, I think, the best part of 10 months. And there's other examples of um, alleged wildlife crimes where there's, again, photographic evidence which hasn't been, um, hasn't been brought forward. So what, what, what's, the, what's your thinking about how you use this? Because clearly alerting the public to the potential for crimes that have been committed in these areas could bring in uh, more additional evidence. In that case, uh, the one you mentioned there, but I think Andy probably has uh, some specific details around that you can share. I mean, going into that specific case, obviously that evidence didn't become available for uh, at least three weeks, or three weeks approximately after the, the incident had occurred. Extremely poor picture, photograph. Um, one person with possibly with a firearm at the time. And it was brought to the attention of the, the partners who... I think it was the Highland Poor Group at the time, that's who it came via, um, and um, we obviously investigated that. But by the time that uh, it was a grainy picture without clear ability to identify anybody, and you couldn't, whilst we can infer what they were doing, and I think everybody probably knows why the people were there, actually there's no wildlife crime committed on that occasion. So, you know, we could, uh, you know, uh, suggest we could put that out into the public domain, but we would actually... We didn't have anything concrete to actually say there's a wildlife crime here. What the photograph shows is two people under a tree, one with a firearm, we've decided in the end. But it took, I gather, 10 months for you to actually release that picture, and there is a, there is a concern. Well, there's no, there's no beneficial, there's no the evidential the gain to be made from releasing that at the time, and that's the reason that the decision was made. Okay. Can I ask about the length of time, then, that it takes to determine whether evidence is admissible or not, or whether evidence can be circulated to the public or not, there, there is a concern out there that, that the length of time that this evidence, whether it's you know, substantial or not, sits there uh, is an issue, particularly when you're trying to gather um, additional evidence on the back of that with leading to prosecution. It's perhaps an issue for the, the Crown Office as well. I think that there's two separate issues there, I suppose, in relation to um, the admissibility of evidence and also about the release of evidence, which probably the, the police are best placed to answer. In relation to the admissibility point, um, prosecutors are under a duty to review evidence um, and, and keep up that review throughout the case. So I I don't think it's um, suggested that we hadn't considered case, the evidence or looked at the evidence, but what we have done in these cases is review that evidence. And in some circumstances, further evidence and information has come to light. And by that, it means further information and evidence has been provided to the Crown. 
And with that, we can then re-review all that we have um, to, to form a better idea about the admissibility and the means in which evidence was obtained. Um, I don't know if that helps answer your point in relation to admissibility. Um, and is, if there's anything else I can add in relation to the release of evidence. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, cr the Crown w wishes to be as transparent as possible when decision making. Um, and that is one of the things we seek to do when making decisions in the public interest. Probably to add to that um, is the, the fact that, again, each case uh, is different. Uh, gathering evidence within a, a wildlife crime environment, as mentioned before, is, is very difficult sometimes. It takes a, a long period of time to go through what we'd say standard actions to get, try and gather evidence. There's a forensic examination that's required as well, which takes time as well. That doesn't happen immediately. So there are a number of factors. So, you know, if, if you know, Police Scotland have enough evidence that we say, to present to the Crown, we will do it timelessly, but sometimes that evidence gathering process does take quite a long time for a, for a number of reasons. Uh, so we don't, we don't <coughs> delay unnecessarily. We will try and present as and when we can that there's enough. And of course, while we, while we have investigations ongoing, we're in regular dialogue with the Crown Office to say you know, we have this uh, um, uh, you know, brewing at the moment uh, and uh, you know, this is where we are. So, um, so we work closely together in terms of that uh, process as well. Thank you. Uh, Finlay Carson will be followed by Claudia Beamish. Thanks. There's obviously some public frustration when there's evidence uh, <coughs> available and it's either submissible or not submissible. And, and you suggested there can be sometimes creative use of existing legislation. The, the, the problem with that is it, it could work both ways. It could work in favour of the perpetrator, but it could also impinge on some other uh, human rights. Is, is it, when was it last the legislation last looked at? And, with advances in technology and whatever, is it something that should we really need to seriously take a stand on and, and look at what technology is available and, and trying to change the legislation to be fit for purpose? Well, if you're, if you're uh, Sarah, I don't know if you've got anything, but in terms of wildlife crime uh, investigation legislation, I mean, really, the only one under review just now is the Protection of Wild Mammals Act, isn't it? Uh, uh, which uh, is part of the, the fox hunting, uh, you know, uh, issue. But uh, in terms of the use of technology, and don't forget, wildlife crime is a crime like any other crime. So, uh, reviewing uh, legislation for better use of technology um, is clearly something that we will feed in uh, as the primary investigator within uh, Scotland to where we see there are potential gains to be made. But at the moment. I'll be honest with you, I'm not aware of any that's a specific target unless you are, Sarah, or, well, no. But the, but the use of technology, uh, so they've carry on further, the use of technology and the creative use of evidence gathering, uh, when you think about the, the, the burgeoning of the internet, uh, social media, um, you know, uh, phones, you know, we, we, we gather evidence and we'll present it. And if it's something that uh, hasn't been done before, um, and I'm trying off the top of my head to think of something recently, but if there's something that hasn't been done before, then clearly that discussion with the Crown takes place, uh, and uh, it may be something they either present or then would be tested in court, you know. Uh, but, um, you know, so I can't think of any legislation at the moment that's specifically been... So just, just, just to, cl to clarify this point, isn't the, the situation here, it's not about a specific piece of legislation. From the letter you wrote to us, the particular cases we were talking about involved the Land Reform Act to involve the Outdoor Access Code. And there's been a suggestion to this committee that there's an element here about the Data Protection Act of 1998 as well. So it's really about meeting a series of tests, isn't it, for admissibility? I think there's the general test in relation to admissibility. Um, I, th I think what's quite interesting is when you look at the law on admissibility, the, the case that we still follow is Laurie and Muir, which is a 1950 case. Now, to some that would sound you know, archaic, but actually what the law does and what investigators do is they evolve in terms of what's facing them. So in terms of the way the law develops, when we see the use of social media and we see the use of technology and crime, the, the law develops with that. And, and again, it, it just turns on the facts and circumstances and, and how we can then apply it. There will be instances and cases where there's a novel or a new approach or the first time that social media was used or the first time that a mobile phone evidence was used. 
Um, but we will push where we can in terms of Crown prosecutors um, to test those types of evidence and, and to test how the admissibility of the evidence that's obtained in that. Um, so I, I'm not concerned about the kind of lack of legislation if there's a consideration about that around that. I think that our law develops as that progresses. Just a question. Sorry. In prosecutions, or uh, is going to come about by uh, cases being tested through the courts rather than changes in legislation in regards to video evidence or, or photographic evidence? I think it's difficult to say what legislative change would be meaningful um, in, in the abstract without a specific goal in mind. Uh, it is possible to use video evidence in, as evidence in a prosecution. The question is, what are the full facts and circumstances surrounding the obtaining of that evidence that can impact on the admissibility? So I think, I think it's fair to say from, from a crime perspective, uh, there's not, we've not identified a huge gap in the law. Uh, obviously, it's for, it would be for the Scottish Government to consider <coughs> whether a uh, uh, further development of legislation is required um, to, to address any concerns surrounding uh, the use of uh, covertly obtained video evidence um, in the context of wildlife crime. Uh, but in, in terms of us applying the law to the facts and circumstances of cases, um, we are able to use video evidence uh, in cases. It, it just depends on how that evidence has been obtained and the, the, full, the full story behind each, each case. Um, <clears throat> each case, as, as we've said already, has, is considered its own, on its own facts and circumstances. And uh, so it's not that we can't use video evidence and photographic evidence. Uh, it depends on, on each case um, how that evidence has been obtained. I, just a, a, a final swan. So uh, when you look at the number of cases that are brought forward that uh, hinge on uh, greatly on video evidence. Is there a frustrating number of cases that you can't take to full prosecution because of the limitations of the current legislation? And does that frustration, is that going to change because of uh, you know, decisions that have been made? Or is it, would it be better if the legislation was to change to make that easier? I don't know if I'm explaining myself very properly. Uh, uh, have you got a lot of cases that if uh, they hadn't been tested already. If the legislation was clearer, would there be fewer people get off because of the technicalities of submissible uh, video evidence? In, in recent times, the proportion of cases in which the admissibility of video evidence has, has not permitted the prosecution to proceed uh, are relatively small. Right, okay. Can I just pick up Sarah Sean on, on the point? And, and Sean Scott will correct me if I'm wrong here. Essentially what you said earlier, Mr Scott, was that from your perspective, third parties ought to be aware of the legislative and admissibility constraints that are at play here. Is that, is that a fair summary? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, 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 their reason for, for example, you know, whether it's RSPB or another body, is, is placing a camera uh, in a certain location, um, then what is the purpose for that camera being there? If, if it's for the purpose because they suspect there's criminal activity, then there's an issue there because the, the legislation doesn't allow for that. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's there for research and development and, and, and you know, academia, mm -hmm. you know, then fine. But, but the, the, the purpose of that camera deployment is, is the key part yeah. uh, and uh, as it is for you know, okay. police investigation. So. All of that said, has there been any follow-up dialogue on the part of the Crown Office and or Police Scotland with multiple third-party organisations who might be inclined to do this to make it much clearer to them if that were necessary about the do's and don'ts? Well, I mean, I chair the Raptor Priority Group uh, and that's been a discussion at group meetings over the last year um, and uh, I've explained to them exactly where, why, why the, the, the law is uh, as it is uh, and the constraints that that then brings. Uh, and obviously the, the law is there for a reason, uh, for, and human rights have been mentioned as well. And, uh, but 
Um, the, the, the purpose for them then deploying camera, they're quite clear, certainly in the group that I've uh, been involved in, about uh, what the, the constraints are. Um, and I've also explained to them as well about how I was trying to look at existing legislation and see if there was a more creative use we could make, but um, uh, but, but there is uh, there is limitations, or there are limitations, okay. I should say. So. Okay, there's a number of questions one of the colleagues want to get in here to wrap up this section, so very briefly, John Scott followed by Claudia Beamish. Yeah, just to pursue that point, at what point does it become an infringement of a landowner's uh, human rights uh, when cameras are placed covertly and knowingly flouting the law? So by organisations such as RSPB, it appears. Well, I mean, I mean, the, the, the landowners, um, I mean, Andy, you probably know a bit more yeah, about that. Part. I think, I mean, that's that's obviously not a question for us. To, no. So that's a question for the likes of the RSPB and to look at what the Land Reform Act allows you to do, enter land for. Uh, and well, the Land Reform Act clearly does not allow. And that's part of the discussions we regularly have with some of our partner organisations. And I think that's probably <laughs> the answer that you're looking for. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. It's obviously a very complex issue, this. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, um, particularly, um, Mr. Scott, I, th I think you said that um, any change in legislation, correct me if I, if I got this wrong, but any change in legislation would be a, a broad issue around um, video evidence or whatever. What, my question is quite specific, but the other questions I had have actually been answered, whether I feel positive about the answers or not, I understand the reasons for them. W would it be um, useful to um, police um, inquiries if there, there was specific change to legislation, if this was possible, in order to enable partner groups to, um, with permission, and I use that word advisedly, to actually um, have um, video set up covertly in that, these are often in very, very remote areas of Scotland, such as in South Scotland, in, in Lead Hills, where, oh, near Lead Hills, not in Lead Hills, I stress, where um, there, there was an alarming situation, which is alarming for the public as well, to see um, something about a, a, somebody in a balaclava jumping onto a quad and driving away, you know, with or without a weapon, and, we're, and there's there may well be debate about that, but I'm, I'll get to the point, which I think I've made already, but is there the opportunity to look specifically at this part of wildlife crime and see whether there is a need to change legislation? And I stress on the back of John Scott's question that while it may be complications in relation to um, ECHR, um, a definition of privacy in these circumstances would be possibly very relevant because um, what privacy is being infringed um, by um, filming somewhere that doesn't film into someone's window or someone's car to see if a criminal is going to come along and, and vandalise it again or whatever. So I'm very interested to know whether there's an opportunity that would help with your investigations and with better protection for wildlife. Um, along those lines? I mean, I suppose simplistically, if there were more cameras uh, in remote places where we think there may be um, a wildlife crime being committed, then it's obvious that that might benefit. Um, I think the complexity of the issues that underpin all that uh, are, as you rightly point out, the main challenge and the definition of privacy. So I think it's part of the debate we've had previously then. So somebody walking in a remote or somebody in a remote area, uh, do they have an expectation that they're being they're private there, or the fact that they're out in the open and therefore exposed to anyone looking? Then there's no expectation of privacy, and it is it's a fundamental part. I don't think there's any doubt. Um, so yeah, simplistically, more cameras might mean more evidence. It might not, but it might mean. But I think uh, the complexities around that, and it's, it almost feels like it's a public debate required in that, then uh, then it's something for me or, or uh, even a legislator to decide uh, arbitrarily. But uh, very very difficult subject. Very difficult. Can I just, I just say? I, mean, I think it's, it was touched on right at the very beginning, though. It's the impact that this would have on wider legislation away from wildlife crime. Yeah. That's yeah. what you've always got to remember in the background here. So if you were to allow that in wildlife crime situation. What's the next step? That's why I asked whether there was any. And it, it, the, the, it makes it very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Donald Cameron, followed by Stuart Stevens. Um, just to sum up, uh, I think the position in terms of the law, 
you have the, the common law rules, you have Article 6 of the Convention, you have RIPSA, and I think the general position is, and please disagree with me if, if this is wrong, that you judge each case on its facts, um, and you look at the irregularity in obtaining evidence. You don't necessarily exclude it, but if there is no warrant, for example, you probably would. If there is a warrant, but you go beyond the warrant, in terms of the warrant, you probably would. There's the old fruit of the poison tree argument, etc. cetera. Um, and in, particularly in this case, you have covert cameras um, that perhaps are not authorized. With all that in mind, and I think the nub of the issue is this, is there anything in wildlife crime, given the difficulties that we all appreciate in reaching successful prosecutions, is there anything that justifies treating it differently to other forms of crime? Can you see a, a situation where we can make an exception and treat it differently? Or are we, are we at the, the general position? I, I think there are other examples of crime committed in remote areas where, where there are the same challenges that you face in detecting uh, and gathering sufficient evidence of a wildlife crime. Uh, I don't think the challenge is necessarily unique to wildlife crime. So therefore, on that basis, I'm, I'm not sure that there is a basis for treating wildlife crime differently to other, to other forms of crime. I mean, one, you talked about, I think Laura Buck and you talked about Laurie versus Muir in, and, and its applicability even now. Interestingly, in that case, um, the, I think there were private inspectors. So it was analogous to the situation of a third party um, so it's, it's directly in point, and I think, I think my question around third parties is this: um, How, if, if say the RSPB obtain evidence that because it's not authorised is not is not admissible, is there an opportunity for the police to obtain evidence like that which would be admissible? Is, is that a, is that a situation you can envisage? I mean, what we have spoken about is partnership working and that if the RSPB become aware of a crime or have evidence of a crime or the, the potential for a crime to be committed, then they should contact Police Scotland to work together in terms of looking at the best way and means of obtaining evidence to evidence that crime. Um, and it, it is difficult because a lot of these questions will come down to intent in terms of the purpose of putting um, the cameras in the place. And we have routinely and regularly say that in relation to wildlife crime, by the very nature of the types of crimes that are committed, it's difficult to firstly identify the crime, then to identify a perpetrator. So, so we are live to those issues too when we're looking to con consider um, the law and the applicability um, of whether evidence can be properly used. Uh, and sorry, I was just going to follow up on a further point in relation to our partner agencies. In relation to a number of cases um, th that we've discussed this morning and after some decisions to, to not continue, our Crown agent did meet with RSB along with the head of um, Wildlife and Environmental Crime to discuss those cases and to also put steps in place for future in terms of better commu communication and dialogue and debriefing in relation to instances where this arises again. And again, that's all about um, education and thinking about how perhaps we can best work together to get the evidence needed for successful prosecutions. Okay, okay. thank you for that. Uh, Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Ali Crowley, and I think that will wrap up this part there. Um, vicarious liability. Um, in the countryside, it already exists, for example, in relation to dumping. In other words, if a third party dumps something on your land that's polluting, SEPA will come after the landowner, even though the landowner is entirely innocent of the original crime. So there are examples. But I also believe, and I may be corrected on this, did we not legislate for a small bit of vicarious liability in relation to uh, landowners becoming liable in wildlife crime for the actions of... Yes, I'm getting nodding heads, so my recollection is correct. Is that working, and is there scope for limited extension of vicarious liability? I mean, you could go to the ultimate extreme. I'm not proposing this. I don't think you could do it, but you could make landowners responsible for everything that happens on the land, whoever does it. Um, I, I just don't see how you could go there, but, you know, in theory, you could go there. 
is there an incremental change you could make in relation to vicarious liability, which has been part of English law at least for 100 years? There are circumstances where we can look to prosecute people in relation to vicarious liability. And I know, I, I understand last year there was some discussion in relation to the application of vicarious liability and how we can successfully prosecute it. L like much of wildlife crime, it's not straightforward mm -hmm. and it's difficult sometimes to identify who owns the land, ah, um, yes. who has the beneficial yes. rights in relation yes. to the land. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of what goes on the land. Um, on, on to, in order to prosecute successfully, we then have to also ensure that, um, or, or look at all the evidence. Again, the landowner may have some defence in terms of the due diligence that they mm -hmm. had carried out, mm -hmm. and what their knowledge was in terms of what was being carried out on the land also. Um, so the police as investigators and we as prosecutors just have to follow that trail. And quite often we start with the prosecution of, say, a gamekeeper, um, and we then follow that back um, to, to see whether we can then mount a successful investigation and then prosecution in terms of the landowner. And again, we will, if we can do, and if there's sufficient evidence for us to mount such a prosecution. Uh, can I just say I would regard gamekeepers as one of the front line of protecting our environment, mostly just to be yeah, clear about that. But sorry, there was an example in terms of yeah. how to, to use it. Yeah. Ali Crowley, finally. Do I come back to the point Detective Chief Superintendent Scott made, that example of the RSPB believing there's criminal activity and sticking a camera up and then it not being admissible, but... You know, what is working relations? And I think you touched on it as well. What is the working relationships? Because you would assume that if the RSPB believed that there was strong grounds to believe there was criminal activity, they would be working with Police Scotland, uh, who take this, this level of crime as serious as every other crime. Uh, and that, that the police would then be able to put a camera in place if they believed that there was a strong case for criminal activity. So what is that relationship? And is the resources there to be able to do that? Just like if you were in a community and there was there was a hot spot identified where, where there was some kind of behaviour, then the police can stick a camera up uh, that will often deter every bit as much as catching someone. If, if anyone, whether it's RSPB or I suspect there's criminal activity, then we need to know about it as soon as possible and then we can assess it and then we can uh, uh, decide on the investigative strategy for that. Um, now, if, if RSPB, and I'm not going to speak for them here, we, we, we work closely with them. In fact, uh, Andy and I had a meeting with their head of investigations and uh, uh, others uh, looking at uh, the development of uh, you know, our, our working relationship, which is, is, which is great. Um, but there, we, still, we still have to have enough suspicion to then take on a, an investigation. That would not, from our side, involve the positioning of a camera because it doesn't fit the legislative or the, the legal requirement because wildlife crime in itself doesn't fit that uh, you know, directed surveillance uh, threshold. So if RSPB are going to deploy a camera, as I mentioned earlier on, then it's for their reason only. They couldn't come to us and say, we suspect criminal activity, so we're going to put a camera in and therefore you can then use the evidence. That can't happen, and has never happened. If the RSPB have deployed a camera, for whatever reason they deem fit, and then they come and tell us later, oh, by the way, we now have footage, then clearly we can, we can assess that footage in terms of its uh, um, uh, importance and in investigation, whether uh, it's you know, criminal or not, and then if it is part of a criminal investigation, then we will report it. But, so we can't be involved in a decision to deploy a camera based on suspicion of criminal activity, because that, that would, we would be breaking the law doing that. So, they, so sorry, I, I, just to repeat, their deployment of a camera is a decision for them, and if they think there's a criminal act, they should be telling us first, and then we can think about what's the best approach to this. If they have a, a camera deployed for research, and then it uncovers criminal activity, or sort of suspected, then they need to tell us about it as soon as possible, and then thereafter we have a discussion with the Crown about admissibility. So we are not complicit or involved in any decision-making about deploying cameras by anyone other than ourselves. So, so given the, as we said earlier, the advancements in technology, Given that, that one of the 
the, the methods that would seem to be able to actually catch criminals committing uh, wildlife crime, and given the intelligence that RSBNB and others come up, do we not need a change in legislation that allows the police to be able to deploy cameras where they believe that there is evidence of criminal well, activity taking exactly, place? Well, yeah, exactly. That's what I mentioned before. I mean, we, we could not do it unless there was a change in legislation, the threshold was reduced, or, or the, the, survey, the authorization. Like, there's a whole complex uh, suite of issues here, but uh, and. And that will come back to the point made by um, a colleague over there, is that um, why would it just be for wildlife crime? It would be for crime in general, because surveillance, directed surveillance, is an issue, obviously, of public concern, human rights. So, uh, so the legislation would have to change, but it would have to change probably across the whole crim uh, criminal uh, uh, landscape, I would suggest. Um, but. Uh, but really, so, you know, the NGOs and charities that have cameras and use them, it's entirely up to them. But they, are, they know what the law is in terms of, you know, uh, admissibility, and as, as has been described by, uh, by Sarah. Okay. So. Right. Sorry, can I just say, I think one of the things, obviously, is that, that one of the, the uh, uh, things you have to hit as well in terms of deploying surveillance is about the expected sentence. Um, and obviously, we have spoken with Sentencing Council uh, about wildlife crime and expressed the, the, the view that, you know, the level of sentences available uh, uh, in terms of the wildlife crime legislation obviously don't meet the threshold often for the, for the deployment of uh, uh, cameras. So there, it's possibly one uh, step that you could take down that line, but obviously the, the, the wider impact in terms of um, just deploying cameras in, in wildlife crime situations has to be taken in, in the whole context. Yeah. Okay. Now, I mentioned that before, but the, the serious crime threshold, the three-year sentence, there's also a level of violence that's expected within there that uh, determines whether we can deploy cameras, so, um, so it's, it's complex. Okay. okay. Well, I think we've, we've clarified that, hopefully quite effectively. Um, I'm going to move on and deal with the wider issue of raptor persecution. Mark Roscoe. If you could look specifically at the figures that are in the report, I mean, on the face of it, it appears that prosecution rates are going down, not up. So wh why is that the case? Or are there issues to do with the accuracy of the figures on which, on which this is based on? Your question in relation to raptor persecution? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> So we've got a 19% decrease in offences. However, there's been a 39% increase in cases. Um, and that also doesn't take into consideration the tagged uh, golden eagles as well, which presumably might even push that, that number of cases up. So there does seem to be a, t a trend of decreasing uh, successful uh, prosecution. So what are the underlying reasons for that? I'm not sure it's possible to comment specifically in relation to raptor persecution based on the stats in the report, but... Is that an issue in itself, then? Uh, possibly. Um, the, stick, sticking to your, your main question to begin with, uh, I think it's... That there were slightly less cases reported in 15-16 compared to 14-15 and there were slightly less cases uh, prosecuted. However, the same conviction rate was maintained um, in respect of the number of cases, uh, in, in terms of the overall number of cases prosecuted. There was a 70% uh, of cases prosecuted, there was um, a conviction, and that was the same in 14-15. So there's not been a percentage drop in the, the number of um, uh, convictions in that sense. Um, obviously, a, a court a court has to take into account the the evidence in a case, and uh, and our job as the crown is to present the evidence to the court. Um, so the I'm not sure that the based on the information in the report, we can see that there's been a reduction in a uh, conviction for a uh, raptor persecution crime. I mean, last year we looked, uh, last time this committee took evidence, we looked at a number of cases which hadn't actually been uh, reported under, under the wildlife reporting um, from previous years. I'm just wondering if there, are, if there are other cases which are not forming part of this picture right now. And I mentioned the tag golden eagles that have been subject to a particular study. 
uh, which, which should presumably result in a case being investigated in, uh, in relation to their disappearance. So, I mean, how, how accurate do you think this data is? I think we can only consider the cases that are reported to us and as we mentioned earlier in relation to, to crimes that come to us, the, a crime will have been identified but also um, the person responsible will have been identified and there'll be evidence to support that and th there's quite difference in terms of the figures that we'll get in terms of crimes. Um, and I'm sure um, Sean will want to come in on that in terms of what the police will determine as a crime to what ultimately becomes to us as a reported case. There will be a difference in terms of the figure because by the time it gets to us, there will be an, for us to consider there will be an accused as well as charges that are supported um, by evidence which has been um, investigated by the police. We touched on this last year also in terms of our system that we use in Crown Office is primarily there to um, assist in the prosecution of cases and for us to use that system for that purpose. It's not there to be able to pull these figures and stats from. And whilst I know Sarah and our team do a put a huge amount of work into pooling as much accurate information they can from our system. And I think we should say year and year we see an, uh, an improvement in terms of the clarity of the figures that are before the committee. Um, there will be differences and the inability to reconcile some figures as we move from organisation to organisation and ultimately when we get to the courts and they will record crimes in a different fashion also. Can I, can I just say, first of all, I think um, we're quoting percentages here when we're talking about small levels of uh, figures and percentages can be quite misleading in terms of... Uh, um, uh, of, of, of the picture it paints, so I think we have to actually talk about the figures. However, um, you know, in terms of the Golden Eagle satellite tag report, yes, we, yes, that's uh, very concerning. The, the, the evidence that was in the, the report, but we have to also uh, uh, look at the figures and we look at a report of a, a missing satellite tag eagle and say, is there sufficient there to record a crime? And often there isn't sufficient evidence to record a crime. And that's that obviously is is, a, is an issue, you know, that we, we can't we can't just uh, ignore the fact that there, there's not there isn't sufficient there for us to actually physically record a crime, according to the crime recording standards that are applicable right across the whole of uh, of crime recording, whether it's for assaults or thefts or wildlife crime. So, what improves the prosecution, the successful prosecution? Is it? Better quality pictures, less grainy, or I mean, what, what, evidence? What? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, the, the ability for uh, colleagues in the Crown Office to prosecute is based on the quality of the case that we can present. Uh, and as we've, we discussed at previous committees, the evidence gathering um, uh, challenges are, are, are stark in terms of wildlife crime because of all the reasons we've rehearsed before. So uh, we will uh, do everything we can to get that evidence. Um, but uh, just sometimes isn't there because of the remoteness, because of the circumstances, because of a whole a host of factors. So um, it's, uh, it can be challenging. And we do work hard. So we, we work well <coughs> together. There's a strong and good working relationship between Police Scotland and ourselves, as well as a number of um, NGOs. And so often we will be discussing cases um, and discussing um, potential cases. And if we have, for example, cases reported to us where we don't think that there is a sufficiency of evidence, we can go back to the police and discuss that with them. Um, we can discuss what, what voids could be filled, what potentially other investigations could be undertaken. Um, we can keep cases on review. Um, so th there are means to us when we're looking to target and ensure successful prosecutions that it doesn't end when the case comes to us, that there's an open dialogue. And if there is a means to securing conviction, that we will work towards that with the police or other reporting agency. There's a, a commitment in this year's report, welcome commitment, to use more scientific data as part of the evidence to understand where wildlife crime may be happening. What, what action have you taken in the last year on the back of that ecological data? Are you now, for example, targeting particular hotspots around driven grass more shoots, shoots where there may be increased levels of persecution? How are you actually using that data now to target your resources in evidence gathering? 
Well, police activity um, continues. I mean, I think it's probably worth pointing out at this point, um, you'll be well aware of the, the programme for government and the, the desire of the government to, um, to invest in, in wildlife crime. So uh, we have a, um, an additional support officer starting at the end of this month uh, to work with Andy, um, Detective Constable. It's an additional resource to support national investigations. Uh, we have the start of the dedicated rural and wildlife crime special constables cadre in the Cairngorms National Park, which again, uh, is an area of concern when you think about the um, uh, satellite tagging report. Uh, so they'll be dedicated in, in those areas. Um, we still have the, the structure, uh, I think within Scotland, that's still the envy of other UK police forces in terms of our dedication in, uh, to wildlife crime investigation, not just through the dedicated wildlife crime liaison officers and part-time ones, but the fact is that the whole organisation is there to investigate crime. So I think I'd mentioned previously, I've got a single point of contact in criminal investigation departments within every division, who is the, the, uh, the go-to person, if yeah. you like, to advise on um, the quality of investigations required based on circumstances. And all my detective superintendents in the divisions are well aware of the requirements around wildlife crime. Yeah. So we have the structure there, we have the support intelligence, is still the lifeblood of any investigation, uh, whether it's wildlife crime or other crime. So, you know, generating intelligence, which I, I hope through the, the structure that we have there and the, the additions, that we can start to generate more intelligence but, to allow us to then... Okay, but uh, in investigate. terms of the intelligence that you have generated around the science and the ecology, how are you using that data? That was my question. I appreciate the changes that, that I'm in not, terms of structure. Ecology data, so how, I mean... You how know, are you I think, using the scientific data to target the, that resource that you've just described? in a way to tackle wildlife crime in hotspots areas? Well, I, I, you know, I think really that scientific data probably confirmed what many people uh, suspected in terms, in, in terms of where the areas were right. around the country. Of where we, I think we, we were aware of where areas were that uh, birds of prey were disappearing. But there is local engagement. There's, there's constantly been local engagement where, where from the local police with uh, estates, etc in terms of getting a prevention message out there and, and, uh, and highlighting the, that, that issue that these birds are disappearing. And, and, and I know this year that uh, our Highlands and Islands Division, for instance, are uh, actively engaging with, with, with the states, um, you know, uh, especially, the one, especially where there is um, um, an indication that birds have disappeared. You know, and this is no indication of guilt of an estate. This is just because... Uh, that there are, there are some extremely uh, intelligent people out there who would uh, like to, um, to point a finger at an estate when it's not necessarily anything to do with that. Um, but So we're actively engaging with them in terms of getting a message out that we've, we have our full-time wildlife crime liaison officers in those divisions where traditionally uh, birds of prey have been, uh, persecution has been focused. So, you know, that, that sort of work is taking place. And that's really the only scientific development that's come out within the last 12 months. And in fact, we were discussing this prior to this, that there is not, in other areas of wildlife crime, there's no um, significant <coughs> scientific data that's, that's come forward that we could utilise. I think that's really the only report that's come, come out in the, mm -hmm. since we had this last discussion. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think Kate Forbes has a question about general recording. Yeah, just... Uh, I brief question really about the level and quality of reporting because obviously it's been discussed previously uh, in this committee and the ECCLR's predecessor committee about being able to identify trends and having the data to be able to identify trends and this is obviously the second year that the report has been presenting data by financial year. In terms of um, recording and reporting wildlife crimes, what other possibilities are there in terms of how that's presented to be able to identify better trends over um, over longer time periods. Does that make sense? In terms of trends of uh, criminality, well, if you like, the, or? Yeah, the report, the report, the annual report identified a few difficulties with comparing different sets <coughs> of statistics and therefore cautioned um, that care should be taken when interpreting the report. So, for example, prosecutions may not happen the same year as the crime was recorded, yeah. timing being an issue, um, and I could go through the, the list of other points that the report identified. But what are your thoughts on how, uh, in terms of um, reporting on 
um, criminal activity and the level and the quality of reporting, how can that be further improved so that we can identify trends? Hmm. Um, okay, I'm uh, not quite sure because the, the, the quality of the report uh, depends on the nature of the evidence that it contains. Yeah. Um, and therefore, to improve on then successful prosecution, we need to improve probably on the quantity and the quality of evidence, if we can do that. Um, and again, it comes back to all the challenges. Now, I'm not quite sure technically or logistically or resource-wise what we, we can do any more than we are just now uh, in a proportionality um, uh, perspective, from mm. a proportionality perspective as well. Um, so, for example, if, so let's take uh, current trends. So, hair coursing has now started to um, increase activity. So, we've had and a number of successful prosecutions in that. Uh, so, that now is going to become uh, more of a priority for us as a mm. as a in, uh, investigative body. Uh, so, a lot of proactive activity, prevention messages, um, and, and looking closely at that particular activity because we now see a trend in uh, using dogs for uh, criminal purposes. So, so that there, maybe that doesn't then lead to the end game in terms of the report, but the fact that we now focus our activity on what is a clearly an emerging trend, that's mm -hmm. our priority for the coming year. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So both in terms of training, awareness raising, the public, and also our approach uh, as, a, as an investigative body. So. Which presumably is ongoing and is improving all the yes. time. Yeah, it, it, it is ongoing. We, we have monthly information management, which is for internal consumption within the, within the police, which is circulated to all the divisions through the Wildlife Crime Liaison Offices, and that identifies, uh, broken down into the division, the types of crime that's occurring. So that's how we, we pick up on the, the likes of the hair course in advance. And mm. obviously the, the report itself, is there's a significant time lag before the, the information that we're receiving today, for instance, would be reported. And that's just, obviously, there's nothing that police, either police or Crown can do about the way the, the report itself is published. But yeah, we're already picking up on that information management. <coughs> so we're, we're looking at that and we're identifying trends as significant as you can. Again, because of the low figures, it's, it's often quite difficult. Um, but hair coursing is a one where we've certainly picked up on. Cameron. Um, I, I, just to pick up on that, that point. Um, the, I may, may have missed this, but the most interesting um, statistic would be to break these down in terms of the type of crime. So, for instance, in the year 2015-2016, uh, we see that there were 23 uh, prosecutions. How many of those were uh, raptor prosecutions? How many were, were um, traditional poaching prosecutions? Uh, I mean, is, there, is, is it possible to delineate what those crimes were? Because I think we'd all find that interesting. To some extent that you can see that from the report, uh, that's not to say that, that we couldn't look at further breakdown. Uh, for example, you know that there's uh, 15 cases reported, um, three of which involved offences against birds of prey, um, and there's different ways in which we have to categorise the, the cases um, for the purposes of the report, mm -hmm. um, because there can be several offences reported against several individuals. Um, <clears throat> So I think it comes down to how the how the information is categorised, and possibly we could provide um, more information. Well, well, uh, I'm just in terms of convictions. So th in the last year, you had 16 convictions. Um, it would be interesting to know what those were for, just just in in terms of the categories of crime. In in appendix um, two A, there is further breakdown of the convictions for for each um, type of offending. Um, I appreciate Table D talks about offences relating to birds. It doesn't specifically talk about how many of those relate to, to raptors. <clears throat> Pretty. Police Scotland has a system which allows area commanders and divisional ca commanders on a, a weekly basis to know how many crimes have, have been committed across their patch and, and the sections, the headings that they would come under. Is the wildlife crime information drawn from that in part or in, com in totality? So the, the wildlife, well, we record, obviously, through uh, compliance with the crime recording standard, we record every incident that is clearly a crime, we record that. So, um, and that is on our crime recording system. So over and above that, sorry, I'm not quite... No, I'm just saying, 
Are these stats captured from that system? They're from exactly the same system. Exactly the same system. system. Yeah, it's yes. an analysis of performance unit produced the same yes. standard of report that we produce for any other form of crime. So it's, they're drawing from the same statistics, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Just to get it on the record. John Scott. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Uh, I should have declared an interest earlier as a farmer and a landowner in my previous questions, and I do so now. I regret that I did not before. Um, taking you to the generality um, of the report, but also the detail, uh, in your view, uh, what has contributed to the 8% decrease in recorded wildlife crime in 2015-16? And has there been a genuine decrease in wildlife crime in certain areas that you can tell us about? Well, I suppose any, any fluctuation in figures, um, uh, whether upwards or downwards, can either be through um, better public awareness, um, and therefore people are more inclined to report, uh, uh, or it could be genuinely that there, there is less less crime. It's very difficult uh, to uh, to put your finger on that. Um, you know, and, and intelligence that we get. Um, in relation to um, suspected wildlife crime, uh, again we can assess from that. But, uh, but really, so fluctuations are very, very difficult to actually pinpoint. Uh, I would, I would say. Fine, thank you. Uh, do you make an estimation at all of, of of the number of crimes that occur but are not recorded by Police Scotland? Uh, have you a sort of an estimation of crimes that are uh, take place but are not necessarily recorded or followed up? So an, an incident that comes in, if somebody, if a member of the public phones in and, and say they think there is something, uh, there may be a wildlife crime incident, and we respond and it transpires it isn't, uh, then it is not closed off as a, a crime, if you like. It's a non-crime incident. And that clearly is based on the assessment of the circumstances. And, uh, and don't forget as well, you know, when uh, our control room staff have training about uh, wildlife crime and, uh, and what to pass out to front line, the front line, uh, have training as well, and they have all the booklets and, and you know awareness. So, so really, that assessment is based on on knowledge, uh, and if it doesn't fit the bill, then it's not recorded as a crime. Okay. False alarm with good intent. Sometimes it's uh, it's it's written off as, uh, for want of a better expression. I mean, I suppose to come back to the, the question on figures as well is that although we can say that there's 16 cases in which somebody has been convicted or 23 cases in which they've been prosecuted, that doesn't give measure as to how big that or complex that case was. So it's, you know, we, it, it is difficult to measure. I think 8% is quite a small figure to be able to put any idea as to whether there's a decrease um, and it might be that something that we have to look at again next year when we're considering the figures um, and l look at that too. Thanks very much. Um, well, this may not be an entirely reasonable question to ask of you, but um, why has there been a 25% drop in monetary fines given the conviction rate is steady? And what other sanctions are being used? I appreciate that's possibly a question to ask the judiciary, but in their absence and inability to answer the questions here, um, have you a view on that? Whilst uh, I think we can see from the figures there's, there's been a drop in, in that aspect, we can't comment in terms of the, the sentencing. Um, but what I would like to highlight is we have had a custodial sentence this year in relation to hair coursing. Um, we've also had a successful prosecution, the first of its kind, in relation to a mounted hunt. So there are positives that we can take in terms of education, again, in terms of deterrent. Um, and. Uh, in being able to publicise that and as to how seriously we take these types of crimes and also when we're looking at people receiving custodial sentences, it sends a very strong message out to those who would wish to continue to undertake these types of crimes as to how seriously the courts will also take that. Okay. Can you um, tell me whether a lack of police or COPFS resources for wildlife crime impacts upon these statistics? Uh, are there other factors relevant uh, to this? I think you've discussed the, 
I think I can say again, in terms of Crown Office resource, there are five dedicated lawyers who work within the Wildlife and Environmental Crime Unit. And as a proportion in terms of the amount of cases that are received by Crown Office, that's a high proportion of legal staff and experienced legal staff that are dealing with those types of cases. I don't have any concern about the level of resource that's currently um, being utilised by the Crown. Good. And is that a view shared by the police? I mentioned you know, our structure, um, and I think we have a proportionate um, dedication into wildlife crime. But as I say, don't forget as well that it's not just dedicated wildlife crime staff that deal with these. The frontline troops, you know, both in terms of first responders and CID and others, are all involved in crime investigation and will become involved as and when they're required. So. Excellent. Many thanks. Uh, we briefly? proactive strategy policy of crime prevention and do you work with other organisations around that? And I think, I think it's probably uh, important to highlight this point that again part of the, the programme for government uh, was a, a prevention review um, which um, uh, was going to be commissioned and looking at uh, again so you think about partners against wildlife crime we're all there we've all had uh, prevention campaigns at the moment there is an investment in a new one just now uh, I'll, be, I'll be quite frank but prevention is always part of the discussions with all the, the priority groups but the government's program uh, for government which mentions a prevention review that quite hasn't got traction yet um, but we are ready to work with them uh, to look at that and, and develop that as and when possible part of our uh, three years strategy within the police as well has um, mentioned a wildlife crime within that, looking at the challenges, looking at what we need to do uh, to, uh, to con continuously improve, not just there but in other areas. Um, so yeah, prevention is still well on the agenda. I think we've touched on the work of PAW, so let's kind of explore that in a bit more detail. Claudia Beamish. Um, could, I, could I ask um, whoever feels it's appropriate to answer probably um, uh, Mr Scott and Mr Marvin, but um, about a little bit more about poor, and I was um, concerned to see that um, this most recent report notes, and I quote, the executive group met once in 2016. The plenary group did not meet in 2016. And um, you'll recall, um, Mr. Scott, that we had um, some discussion about, uh, to put it at its most polite, lack of communication between some partners within poor last, um, last time uh, with... with um, uh, some difficulties in structure and in view of the remoteness that we were all highlighting earlier and the concerns about um, partnership working. Could you say a little bit more about what's been happening um, with Poor and what the plans are um, for the next year? Well, I, I mean, I don't chair the, no. the Poor Executive, no. it's the Cabinet Secretary that does Correct. that. So, yeah. and yes, I mean, in terms of the frequency of meetings, that is up for the Cab uh, Cabinet Secretary to determine. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we fully engage with that. Um, and again, through the through the priority groups, which we sit in each and every one, some chairing, some as part, there's uh, there's, there's definite coordination there. Um, I think it was probably highlighted last time that um, the, the, the media strategy for Paul, and there was one or two elements where there was media releases going out without uh, a prior circulation or amongst other Paul members so they could comment prior to going out. That was addressed. Um, and, uh, and to be honest with you, it's probably more of enthusiasm than anything else by uh, individual members. Um, and uh, really, so I've, I've no reason to sit here and say that Paul isn't working to any extent, um, uh, but it's work going forward as a, as a single entity, take away the priority groups, but as a single entity, it's clearly obviously something for um, the Cabinet Secretary and the Government to, to, to lead on, if you like. Can I just add though, that the, the, some of the more the poor priority delivery groups at the lower level, beyond, below that, so just as a legislation group, the Raptor group that Mr Scott chairs, et cetera, have met on a regular basis. It's maybe just that that executive level group has not met. Uh, the other groups have certainly met. And, there's, and, be, and lower the level again, there's more informal discussion. So we, we meet with Scottish badgers to discuss various issues and crime recording, et cetera, um, out with the UK badger priority delivery group as well. So those, that engagement is still taking place with the key partners, whether it's at the priority delivery groups or at an informal level. It just it maybe is not, that, not the case that the executive group has met, has met although, you know, the, the right, communication right. still takes place yeah. between so, the individuals concerned. So are there concerned. particular areas that you would like to highlight to the committee that have come forward from any of the, um, of the groups, the subgroups that are working, that we should be aware of or, or you would like to see taken forward over the next year? I, th I, th I think 
I think there's a, there's a, there's a couple of, we've highlighted a couple of issues to you in the, in the letter that we submitted recently, you know, about um, venison dealers' licences and things like that, which is all do document, documented in the, in, the, in the letter in terms of the difficulties that we have uh, with that, you know, which Scottish Natural Heritage have, and, and which that's been take, that is being taken forward. Um, I think we've really highlighted the, the issues in, in there. Um, there's nothing specific that we would like to see taken forward. I mean, we could have a, a, a more formal, there's issues we may bring about uh, hair coursing in terms of uh, the difficulties that we face um, in terms of the retention of, of dogs and things like that. The legislation doesn't allow us to do that. Um, and, and that's the type of thing that we look to bring forward over the, over the sort of next 12 months uh, with, with through the delivery groups and then possibly through through the poor executive, you know, there's nothing perhaps for this state, this uh, meeting here. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, let's, you. You touched on badgers there, so let's move on to badgers. There were seven recorded crimes in the badger area. Only one was reported to cops, uh, which seems a, a rather low number. Uh, I'd like to explore that. Has a prosecution been secured in that particular case as yet? Um, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure about the, 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 the prosecution of that case, but I mean, in terms of the crimes, obviously, again, often these crimes are not uh, reported when they're in action, as it were. So they are immediately, you you're, uh, have the difficulty of then trying to establish who has committed the crime. Um, there's also obviously a lot, you have to have uh, intent or recklessness for, for certain elements of, uh, of the, the Badger-related persecution as well. So that, that also creates difficulties in terms of actually submitting a, a case to, to Crown Office. Um, so th there, are, there are a number of reasons why um, we don't end up, we might have seven cases, but we've only actually got one case that's been taken forward to, to Crown Office. Okay, C can I explore this a little bit further? Because anecdotal, anecdotally, I get the word out, it's been suggested to me there may be other things potentially at play in terms of attitude towards badger crime. So, for example, perhaps where um, if a badger set has been disturbed, damaged, but the badgers are still there, the approach, which I think would be contrary to the Act, is that, well, there's not really been a crime committed, and I'll, well, I'll hold that thought for now. And also, it, are there, is there an approach that says first offenders are maybe being dealt with as on an informal caution level? Is there any kind of slackness cut uh, land managers? I just want to get a feel for where this is at the moment, because it, you know, this is quite an important issue. Well, certainly from the police, I wouldn't say there's any slackness cut to anybody in terms of uh, the reporting of crime. I, I'm not quite sure how to take that comment, to be honest. Well, I'm not, I'm not um, sure yes, that, that, that would, that, I mean, the police always have to form a judgment yeah. based on, on the likelihood of that being taken. And I wasn't well, suggesting well, any impropriety yeah, in no, any that's way. Fine. No, no, we were, was in terms no, that's of, fine. Uh, of uh, approach. I'll pass, that, I'll pass that on to my colleagues. Uh, no, no, we certainly, no, we, you know, at the end of the day, we, we can't afford to, to, to be seen to be doing that anyway. So we would need to, to, if there's a crime to be recorded, we'll record the crime. We look at the circumstances. Uh, we take into account uh, di um, direction that's, uh, that's occurred from previous cases about what is a set, and it's not just it's not necessarily the land on top. It's about what's involved in it. It's also about when when the crime is reported to us, uh, uh, how far after an incident occurred, what we see, what's present when we get there. Is there any evidence of a set in use? Are there badges about there? And often the case is that without actually having a, a, a direct look inside a, a set, you'll never know if it's been damaged. And that's, that's, there's, there's, an, there's an issue there. Now, whether, whether, the, whether you need a legislative, legislative change there to say that it's, regardless it's a strict liability offence, that, that, that's a different issue completely. But and do you get, get any guidance from the Crown Office as to, as to where it's likely to be a prosecution would be proceeded? We will, we'll, we'll, we'll often talk to, to Crown Office on these cases. Um, we, we, as I say, you know, the stated cases from, from, from south of the border, which, which define the set and what is the set at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we also take from uh, Sheriff Drummond's uh, um, view uh, uh, or, or statement about um, what, what the indicators are that are sets in use at the time as well. And that, that's widely accepted by ourselves and by NGOs. Um, but we'll then, when we have the circumstances, we think there's a case there or possibly a case there, we will speak to Crown Office and, uh, and I'll, I'll take this opportunity to say that perhaps in, in my career in the police, the relationship with Crown Office and the, between the Crown Office and the police is probably one of the closest ones there is 
um, because you're able to pick that phone up and you're actually able to get advice straight away about whether they think there's sufficient there. Okay. All right. It's useful to get that on the record. Thank you. Um, moving on to bats, Finlay Carson. Declare an interest as the bat cha a bat champion. Um, the, the, the bats are, 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 made, are named as a, uh, a priority area, but it would appear that uh, bat crimes are not actually reported uh, anywhere other than uh, within other wildlife offences. Uh, why would that be? Well, with bat crime, or, not or, or, beg your pardon, proceedings relating to um, offences against bats are, are included in other wildlife uh, offences, which means it's, it's difficult to actually look to see what the, the number of crimes are and, and what the conviction uh, well, rate is. I think that comes down to the fact that some of the, some of the legislation we're talking about uh, is specific to species, or bats as, as European protected species, and it's about the regulations, which are not just applicable to bats, but are applicable to otters and various other uh, animals as well. So, you know, in terms of uh, that, that's why that it's not broken down into terms of specific acts. So it's not like the Badger Act where you can just pull that evidence right, straight out okay. and say that's all about badgers. There you go. It's 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 because it's under the, uh, it's 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 a it's a piece of legislation that covers a, a wide variety of, of animals. Well, obviously, there's there's not a, a, a huge number of uh, convictions. Is there any barriers to bat crime being reported? Is there underreporting of bat crime? I, I mentioned this last year. You know, the numbers are very low. I think last year there was no. Uh, convictions at all or, or recorded uh, crimes. Is, do you see that there's, there's under-reporting of that or, or is there actually just bat crime is very low? We, we, I think bat crime is, is generally low, um, but again, it's difficult to tell because you know, you, you're talking about small numbers here. And, um, but I mean, I think um, we conduct a number of investigations last year, well, well into the 20s in terms of the investigations across Scotland. Um, there's a, an, again, there's an intentional or recklessness aspect to some of some of the uh, elements of the, uh, some of the charges that could be uh, 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 taken forward, but not for all of them. And that's something we are actually in discussion um, with. Uh, our, I spoke to our crime registrar about it very recently, and we're, we're looking to get clarification on that because um, there's not necessarily a case as any criminal intent um, there. Uh, but that's only in certain elements. That's to, you know so. The, the level of bat crime, it, we, get, we do get certain uh, incidents reported, whether that's to do with the, the cutting down of trees, whether it's to do with the disturbance in bat roosts or, development or developments. It can be in, in a variety of different areas. Um, so, yeah, not significant levels, but certainly, uh, apparently, uh, and according to colleagues in the Bat Conservation Trust, we have, we have uh, you know, we investigate a number compared to, a uh, significant number compared to other forces around the UK. I think the point Andy makes about um, the offence as well, so in terms of uh, crime recording and compliance, we're going to take this issue to um, the technical group for uh, crime recording, the government's uh, crime board, because uh, whilst disturbing a, um, uh, a bat colony is an absolute offence, as Andy said, it's the intent, and if it was unintentional, then is it still a crime? So, so in terms of SCRS compliance, we're going to have that discussion at the technical group. Um, and uh, but you know, obviously, our Crown Office colleagues, if there's no intent, then you know I, I would never determine what a decision would be. But unlikely to be a prosecution of it, wasn't it? You know, there's no intent to commit a crime. But however, uh, we're going to look at that quite closely. Cases that involve bats, one of the things that we look at in terms of severity is to, as to whether, is it as a corporate commercial, yeah. is it in relation to development, is it an individual that's perhaps unaware of either the um, bats being there or the legislation in relation to bats. So we have to take all of that into consideration, but we certainly, as bats as priority, take any case where a bats, um, bats are involved, um, we consider it carefully. So uh, are you suggesting that sometimes it will not come through the police, so there may be a compliance with regards to a, a bat report that SNH would request if someone was p uh, converting an old barn or, or, or through planning permission? Uh, you know, it, it shows here that there's only two cases last year. Are you suggesting that there's actually more cases come before you uh, and they're just dealt with in a different way? No, no um, we can only deal with the cases that we get. So if there are only two cases reported, then we will only deal with the two cases that are reported. I was just trying to give some background into to the discussion about w what, we, why and where we get crimes against bats. I think, I think we, engage with, we engage with SNH in terms of licences. There may be occasions where somebody 
may just be about to commit a crime. We get notified about it. We'll, we'll speak to them straight away and they may stop uh, undertaking the action they're, 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 they're currently taking and then they will then go and get a license from SNH. Or there are occasions where we get told, told about an incident, we investigate and we find actually there was a license in place anyway for that action to take place. So is there maybe a, a, an argument that there should be some reporting of bat crime which is not intentional or inadvertent because the, the crimes that are reported are, are, are crimes because they're intentional, but there may be cases where uh, bats are disturbed, but it's not seen as a, a criminal because it's not with any intent. That statistic can be developed. I mean, once we have the discussion with the technical board of the crime, you can look at that and whether it's, it should be recording or not, and, you know, and then you might get some more information from that. You know, so. Thank you. Um, Finley Carson, do you want to go, move on to hunting with dogs? Uh, yeah, very briefly. You, you've actually touched on it uh, uh, quite a few times. Uh, my, my interest was, was hair coursing. There seems to be a, an increase uh, in hair coursing. And I think it's potentially the, the highest number of uh, uh, criminal accidents involve actually hair coursing. Uh, is there any reason behind it? Uh, and and, and what, what are you actually doing to try and, and cut it out? Because we realise that there's, there's a lot of other criminality associated with those involved in uh, hunting with dogs or, or hair coursing? Um, I think, you know, hair coursing across has, has been a problem, uh, or is an increasing problem across the UK in general, actually. Um, I think, um, you know, it's been highlighted on TV recently um, uh, as well and, and sort of on, on national programmes. Um, yes, it, we've noted it in Scotland increasing. Um, it's a very much almost, it can be an almost like a hit and run in a type instant that people can be one place uh, and then they can commit a crime and five minutes later they're away and three hours later they'll appear somewhere else in a completely different division. Um, now we've undertaken a piece of work with the National Wildlife Crime Unit to look at all the incidents that have come forward, all the crimes that have been recorded and we hope to take that forward in, in, in the coming year um, and look at a bit more targeted action um, Again, as I say, although it's an increase for us, it's not been as significant, I would suggest, as it has been elsewhere in the UK. Um, I think it was Lincolnshire last year or the year before reported 2,000 incidents alone, which when you consider the size of the force down there in comparison to Police Scotland, is, you know, they're they obviously suffering greatly. Um, we haven't seen the levels of intimidation that have, been, have occurred down south yet. We haven't, well, that certainly hasn't been reported to us. Um, so th that's something that we're, we're obviously uh, aware of that has occurred elsewhere. Um, and we've had a number of successes. Um, and, that, uh, you know, there's still obviously there's people being reported just recently in, in East Lothian. And, and we would like to see that, 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 that case come to court as well eventually. Um, so, you know, we look, we look to take it forward. There are difficulties in terms of um, retaining, retaining dogs. There's obviously costs to to be in significant costs to be incurred and we're not in a position to actually claim those costs back even if we have a, a successful prosecution at the end of that um so you know there's all sorts of things like that that we have to we have to consider and then perhaps there's, there's there's a potential for uh again legislative change there and, and again we discussed this issue although it's probably out with the sent possibly out with the sentence in council but about the ability to claw back some of those costs if we incur them in kenneling fees etc for, for taking dogs away from people yeah we have retention notices in, in england now where there's a requirement on the accused if you like to to look after the dogs until the, the end of the, the criminal justice process um, which places the burden on them and thereafter if it's an outcome that it's, uh, that, uh, it's a confiscation then the mood so so that's one one aspect that we could perhaps consider and um, so yeah but there's, there's there are cost challenges with that definitely as andy says okay thanks can i, can I just, just sort of, uh, follow up on that a little bit the structures of police scotland as they exist do they allow for you guys to kind of take a coordinated approach across a few divisions i mean you know the hair course an issue my neck of the woods other areas has, has developed quite considerably so in practice can you coordinate the activity of the wildlife crime officers and others to focus on yeah. on, on this issue this is probably an area where it, where it has occurred more often than than, than other areas you know and that um uh, we will the, the full-time wildlife crime officers liaison officers in particular across a number of divisions will work together so that they're all focused on on, on hair coast and at the same time often 
you know, partnering up, neighbouring up together to, so that they can respond to incidents. But yes, it's, it's certainly something that's occurred in the past and, and we'll continue to look at it in the future, you know, as, as a way to take it forward. It's predominantly in the, the East Coast at the moment because yeah. it's flatter. Obviously, there's better arterial routes for vehicles to, to make off uh, more quickly. Uh, so we're well conscious of that. So there's analytical work going on just now in conjunction with the NASA Wildlife Crime Unit to, to look at that whole picture and we'll better coordinate our uh, response. And uh, there's been actually one or two notable successes in, mm. you know, there's a report of a hair coursing here, but they've actually caught them over here because they've gone to someone else to do it. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so it's uh, definitely a priority for us this year. Okay, that's useful. Thank you. Can I just uh, add, sorry, Grim, I think in terms of speaking about notable successes, and we spoke earlier about the development of the law and moving along, in fact, the, the conviction and the imprisonment that we had earlier this year, it was also the first hair coursing case in Scotland where the DNA evidence okay. was significant and we were able to link the DNA evidence from the dog um, to the coursing. So that's a progression in terms of the steps that we can take to... Um, target this type of crime also. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Donald Cameron, you wanted to look at poaching? And sorry, can I um, also refer to my register of interests uh, as a uh, farmer and landowner, I apologise for not doing so until now, and also to thank you for pointing me to Annex 2A, uh, which contains some of the information that I was asking about. Um, in terms of poaching, this is uh, an issue in the Highlands and Islands, uh, particularly in relation to deer, um, and always has been for a long time. But um, I was interested in, in, in the remark um, Mr. Marvin made earlier about um, coordination. Uh, deer management groups obviously exist across Scotland. And I know that police do on occasion attend some of the local deer management groups um, in, in my region. Um, is that a useful model? And do you see, um, in terms of dealing with poaching in this instance, but, but also wildlife crime in general, do you see that kind of interaction uh, perhaps being useful uh, in terms of raptor persecution and more generally in terms of wildlife crime, that kind of interface between uh, gamekeepers, estates uh, and other land, land managers and the police? I think, I think um, you know, it's engagement with all, with all partner organisations. I mean, if, just to, to go back, I go to the Lowland Deer Network. Mm -hmm. uh, meetings as well, so you know I, I'm, I'm regularly in contact with them. I've got other colleagues who meet with other uh, deer management groups, etc. But you know we do engage, whether it's you know whether it's with Scottish gamekeepers, whether it's whether it's with Basque, you know whether it's with RSPB. We're engaging with all these people uh, re regularly, um, and so um, you know that, because it has to be that sort of approach. We, we need we need eyes. We, we've, we've talked about it constant, constantly, actually, about how. The majority, and I also want to make clear that wildlife crime doesn't just occur in a rural environment. Wildlife crime occurs in urban environments as well, mm -hmm. and it's often something that's missed. But you know, particularly in those rural environments, we, we don't have those eyes and ears. And, and we, we uh, part of, well, for, for instance, one of the things that we've got ongoing at the moment is that uh, up in Highlands and Islands, uh, you, you may be aware or not that the Wildlife Crime mm -hmm. Liaison Officer goes and speaks to the gamekeeper training course. There's mm -hmm. new gamekeepers, so new gamekeepers are, are receiving an input. From um, from the wildlife crime liaison officer. Part of that is to to tell them about their responsibilities, but it's also about engaging with them so that they will then be in a position to provide us with information. Because as we say to say to them, as we say to water bailiffs, oh, the bailiffs on the rivers, etc., those are the people who are out at night and can provide us inf with information not just about wildlife crime but about all forms of, cr of criminality. You know, but by building up that relationship with with the wildlife crime element. Um, you know, we can we can also receive information about all sorts of other uh, crime that's occurring in rural environments. I didn't know that. I'm very pleased to hear it. Okay. Thank you. Can, can I just hopefully wrap this up with a, a, a final question and on an issue that, that was brought to my attention fairly recently and, and caused me some surprise. We talk here about, or we have talked here about, you know, um, gamekeepers and land managers being held to account by the law, and, and rightly so, but. There's been an issue in the Glens of Angus where legally uh, cited traps have been sprung maliciously and interfered with. And I was quite surprised to learn that that's not a breach of the law in any way. Uh, very frustrating for the land managers and the gamekeepers, but it's not a breach of the law. Is that actually the case? Is there, there nothing that can be done about that? There's no legislation about interfering. Specific legislation. I think it was looked at... Uh, many years ago, when the when the, the uh, when legislation about snaring etc was coming, and I felt mm. I think it was felt at the time um, that there was legislation that covered these type of issues, but 
in our opinion, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to do that. Um, but certainly, there's, no, there's nothing in, in legislation that uh, talks about uh, you know interfering interfering with the trap. We've asked, we've, we've we've raised this, we've looked at it on a number of occasions, and unfortunately, there isn't there isn't any specific. However, what what I can say is, actually, the uh, incidents that we're not really receiving significant reports about these sort of incidents. Mm -hmm. Some organisations have suggested it's far greater. The, than, it, than, than the level of reporting we are getting. Basque undertook a survey a couple of years ago, and that suggested that actually it was the, the levels weren't as high as were being mm -hmm. made uh, uh, or being talked about in the public domain. You know, mm -hmm. but you're obviously cited on the frustration that's felt. In oh, the abs absolutely, and if there's an opportunity for us to to uh, to investigate and find somebody responsible for for a criminal offence, then, then we'll take that forward. You know. Okay. John Could I just ask a question on that? related subject of the illegal release of beavers uh, in the tea catchment area. Uh, what, what progress have you made with investigating that? Well, I think that's a, it's a, it's a question that's uh, been raised many times, but it, it, but it comes down um, to proving uh, who is responsible for this illegal release. And I don't think that's, that's ever, been able to, been, ever been able to establish that, despite much speculation. I don't think there's actually any evidence of who may have released these illegally. Okay, well, thank you. Um, can I thank all of you for your attendance today? Um, I think that's been useful to explore the uh, statistics for this year and wider issues. Um, so I thank you for your time. Um, at its next meeting on the 23rd of January, the committee will hear evidence from various stakeholders on the environmental implications for Scotland of the UK leaving the EU, and it will also consider Electricity Works Environment Impact Assessment Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-451. As agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session, and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now closed. And the committee's information. This is my last attendance here because I've uh, now been asked to go and lead a couple of transformation projects for Police Scotland. So, uh, the, the national tactical lead for wildlife crime will be Detective Chief Superintendent David McLaren, uh, who um, was actually involved in wildlife crime when he was in the Fourth Valley area. So he's got uh, good experience. There's apologies from uh, ACC Johnson, who was here last year, but the portfolio, the strategic portfolio, has now moved to ACC Gillian McDonald who again, uh, because it's a very recent change, uh, was unable to attend, but, uh, so, but you'll have uh, Mr McLaren here the next year. And as I say, Andy obviously was here for the first time, but I think it's an invaluable, valuable resource to have for this uh, kind of community. And we'll look forward to working with them and good luck in your new post. Thank you very much. Very briefly.